Listen, drug addict, listen to me, please. My son died from your fatal disease. We tried and we tried to convince him to get help, but he put up that wall of deafness we came to know so well. You are very sick, very sick indeed, and you don't know what you really need. Please let those who love you channel your fate, or your parents will be planning your funeral date. I saw that wall of deafness several times since. One young man is dead, and another one winced. So don't put up that wall of deafness I saw in my son. Though I didn't realize it then, the sad journey had begun. May the 20th, 2005 started like any other day. It was a beautiful day. In the evening, my husband and I went to the Reds game. The Cincinnati Reds had won, and they were having a special fireworks display, not just the normal for winning. Normally, my husband wants to get home and beat the traffic, but that night he was willing to stay. We stayed, we saw the fireworks, and as we were walking back to the parking lot to get our car, I remember saying a little prayer what a good evening it had been and being grateful that he had been willing to stay for that. And when we got home, it was about 11 o'clock, I sat down, got my pajamas on, sat down at the table, started reading the newspaper, and he turned on the TV. About quarter to midnight, we went back to the bedroom to get ready for bed. And as we went into the room, the phone rang. My husband said, oh no, no. I right away thought it was our son Chad, who was in a rehab house, a sober living facility in Cincinnati. And I thought that it was just him calling at odd hours to talk, as he did often. My husband picked up the phone. I was in the bathroom. He fell on the bed saying, no, no, no. Carol, they found Chad dead. I ran in to try to give him support. He was laying on the bed crying. I picked up the phone and I called our other children and I told them what had happened. Our daughter, our one daughter made it to the house by the time we left to go to the halfway house. All the way over, she kept saying, Mom, it's just a sick joke. It's not real. But I knew in my heart it was real. When we got to the halfway house, we found our son on the edge of the bed, covered with a blanket. When we walked into the room, there was a police officer with his arms folded, protecting his body. My husband pulled the blanket off of our son, who was gray and foaming at the mouth. We were all screaming and crying. My husband tried to clean him up, and I jumped up on the bed and tried to cradle him in my arms. I then yelled at the police officer because the last four and a half years, I realized how there are some corrupt officers, as there are corrupt everything. And I was angry, and I was hurt, and I was in pain. He just was there to protect my son's body. One in every five people are addicted to drug or alcohol. 80% of people in prisons are there with drug or alcohol issues. These statistics are 11 years old. I'm sure today they're much worse, much worse. After Chad's death, my husband and I decided that rather than have people throwing their money away on flowers at his funeral, we would have them donate to the Chad Joseph Wagner Memorial Foundation. We took that money, we began a 501c3 foundation called the Foxfire Foundation. Foxfire is dedicated, at that time, our mission statement was to educate the public that drug addiction is a deadly disease. However, because drug addiction has got so much worse, most people that have an ounce of sense realize it, that it's a disease. So now Foxfire's mission is to educate and support families, to give support to those struggling and the, their loved ones. 
We also just had a, um, a big a billboard campaign. We had 61 billboards placed around greater Cincinnati. And we are trying to close before too long, we'll be starting a bus campaign to get bill, billboards on buses. We uh, do public speaking. I've spoken to thousands of school children. We have 11 videos that run in our local cable in Northern Kentucky. Uh, we haven't done any videos for a while, but we intend to, to get that going again also. We have booths at fairs. Uh, we have a Boone County Fair every year. We've been to Kenton County Fair. Uh, and on a personal level, one of the things that I do is I visit ladies in a treatment facility called Rap House. It's a women's residential addiction program. I've been going there for 11 years now, and I have learned so much from the ladies that I visit. In 2010, I started visiting men in Two Rivers, which was a transitional housing facility for men coming out of state penitentiaries, all convicted felons. Most were in there for drug-related issues. Methamphetamine manufacturing and dealing were the two main folk things that the guys were in there for. That facility was shut down in June. However, I am looking to get reconnected with male inmates because I truly truly care for the downtrodden. Um, one of the things that happened, and I, I like to, to let you know this, this is a very wonderful, whenever you give of yourself, you get so much more back than you give. One Christmas fell on Sunday. My husband is not, I'm a Catholic lady, and, but my husband goes with, to Mass with me on Easter, Christmas, and so forth. So, um, that particular year, Christmas fell on a Sunday. And I have a girlfriend who, uh, her daughter had worked for Dockers out in California, and she had come to visit my girlfriend. And the week before Christmas, my girlfriend, Rachel, called me up and said, Carol, I have 30 wallets for your guys. Do you want them? Well, there were 60 some men in that facility. And I said, absolutely, I'll be right out to get them. So I went out and I picked up these nice leather wallets, very nice wallets. And uh, my husband said, you can't take them down there because you don't have enough for everybody. But I just said, just watch me because I knew that I could. So we went to mass and after mass, we went down to Two Rivers. And as we walked in, my husband's carrying the wallets under his arm. And all the guys are, Miss Carol, what do you have? What do you have, Miss Carol? So we go downstairs to their day room, and my husband starts spreading these nice wallets on the table. And before we got there, unbeknownst to anyone, I had called the facility, talked to the person in charge, and had them give me a list of the most needy men in the house, the ones that didn't have family support, the ones that were isolated, the ones that were really depressed and, and in a bad state of mind. And I told them explicitly, I do not want your friends. I want those that really, really need this. So when we got downstairs, a young man came over to me whom I'd never met. And he said, Miss Carol, I'll help you. I'll help you find these guys. So I started out by saying, if you're lucky enough to get one of these, be grateful. And if you're not, be grateful for those that did. This is Christmas Day, goodwill toward men. So I started down my list and little by little we found the guys and they came down and they picked out a wallet. And finally we were down to one name and the gentleman that was helping me said, Miss Carol, he said, Brad doesn't want to come down. He's in his room. And I said, well then I'll go to his room. And my husband said, you can't go to his room. And I said, yes I can. So I climbed two stops, two flights of steps. I do have a lung disease, and that's not easy for me, but I did it. And when I, the young man that was helping me find these folks knocked on his door, and he said, Brad, Miss Carol has something for you. And I heard a voice say, I don't want anything. So I walked into a darkened room. There was a young man with a hoodie on, a slight-built young man, in the bottom bunk of a bunk bed. 
The hood, hoodie was up over his head. He was in a fetal position facing the wall. I walked over to him. I put my arms around him. I told him I loved him, and here was a Christmas gift for you. Merry Christmas. I love you. As I turned to leave, I handed him the wallet. As I turned to leave, he raised up and he said, Miss Carol, I needed that. That was the greatest Christmas gift I ever received in my life, bar none. When you do things for other folks, you get so much more back. As time went on, there were many other stories I heard from the men I visited at Two Rivers. At Rap House, I had a young lady one day, and I've been going there for 11 years now. And uh, I'm very, I'm a tough old lady. I'm, I'm, I'm straight with them, and I call it like I see it, but they know that I care. I give them love and support and encouragement. I try to show them other ways to enjoy life besides doing drugs. I try to expose them. Sometimes I get them sewing. Sometimes, I, yesterday we made Valentine's. And uh, we do fun things. And sometimes we just sit and talk. But I had a young lady come in one day. And when I first thing I say is, how many new girls do we have? In this particular day, the, the, the ones that have been there a while always say, Oh, Miss Carol, we got four new ones. Well, point them out to me. Her, her, her. So as we go around, there was one young lady, and my first question is always, uh, How many times have you been in rehab? And this particular young girl, and she was young, she was about 23, and she said, uh, Three, this is my third time. And I said, Are you going to get it this time? And she said, I hope so. And I looked her straight in the eye and I said, you hope so? Come here. You can't hope so. You got to know so. So we sat down and we started talking. And as we started talking, I said, how old were you when you used your first drug? She said, my mom gave me heroin when I was 12. goes against everything the word mother means to me. goes against everything the word mother means. God bless that child. I call myself a drug addict advocate. I care. And they know I care. And I chose after my son's death to use the energy that God gives me to try to help other people's children. Because when my son was alive, I didn't get it. I will never totally get it because I have never been a follower and I have never been a drug addict. But the most important reputation you have is the one you have with yourself. And every time you make a good choice, you're going to like yourself better. And every time you make a bad choice, you're going to like yourself worse. But every single human being has the power to come out of this and overcome this disease. It is chronic, progressive, and curable, but you can get into recovery and deadly. And in this day and age with carfentanil and fentanyl, you are playing Russian roulette with one empty chamber. And I tell them that all the time. They're dropping like flies. The downside of doing what I do is we do lose people. And that's very, very, very difficult. You somehow feel you failed them, even though you know that you did not have the power to change anyone but yourself. So now, little man, you've grown tired of grass, LSD, cocaine, and hash. And someone pretending to be a true friend says, I'll introduce you to Miss Heroin. Well, honey, before you start fooling with me, just let me inform you of how it will be. For I will seduce you and make you my slave. I've sent men much stronger than you to their graves. You think you could never become a disgrace and end up addicted to poppy seed waste? So you'll start inhaling me one afternoon. You'll welcome me into your arms very soon. 
And once I have entered deep down in your veins, the cravings will nearly drive you insane. You'll need lots of money, as you have been told, because, honey, I'm much more expensive than gold. You'll swindle your mother and just for a buck. You'll turn into something vile and corrupt. You'll lie and you'll steal from my narcotic charms and find contentment when I'm in your arms. The day you realize a monster you've grown, you'll solemnly promise to leave me alone. But the vomit, the cramps, your gut tied in a knot, your jangled nerves screaming for just one more shot. The cold chills, the hot sweats, the withdrawal pains can only be saved by my little white grains. There's no other way and there's no need to look, for deep down inside you will know that you're hooked. You'll anxiously run to the pusher and then you'll welcome me back into your arms again. And once I return, just as I foretold, I know that you'll give me your body and soul. You'll give me your morals, your conscience, your heart, and you will be mine until death do us part. I now call myself a drug addict advocate. I'm a drug addict advocate because I lost my child. I believe whatever we survive in life is our gift. The more we survive, the bigger our gift. My gift is I lost my child. That sounds sick, doesn't it? But if I hadn't lost my child, I wouldn't be trying to save other people's children. If you've come from an abusive childhood, don't look at it as a curse. Look at it as a gift. There's another child out there where you were when you were abused who needs someone that understands. I will never understand addiction totally, never, no matter how hard I try. If you survived abandonment, neglect, whatever it is you've survived in life, look at it as your gift because you understand on a level that others don't. And you can reach out to those kids. And you can re reach out to those people that are struggling with addiction. It will make a world of difference to them. We need more people in our army. Foxfire now, we have an office. We need people that understand addiction to go out there. And I am so grateful that people are willing to give of their time. Most of the times, it's not a monetary gain. But believe me, we get much more than any amount of money. Thank you.